What's metastasizing my tumors? I'm Robert Evans, host of Behind the Bastards, back on the old introduction <laughs> schema, like trying it. it out. How are we feeling about that? I loved it. Yeah, everybody loves a good metastasization. It's a great word. Um, one of my favorites. It sounds Billy. satisfying. Yes. You're Billy Wayne Davis. Depending on who's asking the question, yes. Yes, yes. There are no lawmen in the room, so yes. you are Billy Wayne Davis. Yes. How are you doing, Billy? I'm good, overall. Do you have any exciting plans for, I don't know, roughly like two weeks from now? Yeah. Ish? A I little do. more? Like a Sunday? Three? Like a Sunday? Yeah, like a Sunday? Yes, I do. A someday somewhere between two and three weeks from now? Mm-hmm. In a city somewhere between Phoenix and San Francisco? Yes. I'll be yep. there. I, I do okay. have specific plans. Yeah, this is all lining up. Yeah, this episode was supposed to be advertising for this thing happening in between Phoenix and San Francisco, but it's sold out, so there's no need to drum up excitement anymore. No, there's no need. It's the what, best. Whatsoever. The best. There's no work and, involved. No, and I, I suggest that as a result, we callously disregard the emotions of our fans in this episode. I, I thought we already did that. Yeah, yeah, but like, like, like hardcore negging. Like oh, that, okay. Oh, that, like yeah. aggressively, like on purpose. Yeah, yeah, okay. like really, really <laughs> aggressively. Speaking of aggressive, Billy. Yes. How do you feel about cancer? I don't like it. Not a fan, huh? No. Not a cancer stan? Overall, no. Over, overall, but there's some upsides. Uh, I can't, you know, you can't say there's not upsides to everything, so... There are, uh, yeah, every now and then the right person gets cancer, and I don't want to disregard, you know, I'm a, I'm very much a Moe's death, uh, fear not of man because men die sort of guy. Like, uh, like the, the, who's the most recent guy who died of cancer who sucked? Uh, well, I say Limbaugh just got it. And I Limbaugh, think, exactly, like, exactly. People were like, okay, all right. No, like, yeah. I think at the best, people were like, some people were excited, but everybody else was like, I don't feel anything. Yeah. That's probably good. Cancer's like a drunk redneck with like a short barrel AR-15 with one of those 240 round drums. He doesn't often hit what he's aiming at, but every now and then he does. <laughs> that is a great, <laughs> is a terrible and great analogy of this. <laughs> so I don't know. In, in all seriousness, cancer's a big pile of ass. Um, yes. And it's unfortunately one of those asses that medical science is not as equipped to kick as we might like. No. Um, and despite the wonderful advances in medicine over the last century, thousands of people every year wind up in the nightmarish situation of having some doctor tell them, I'm sorry, but there's just nothing we can do. Uh, and even more people wind up in the position of a doctor saying, we can beat this, but the treatment's really going to suck balls. And the fear and pain that accompanies both these situations presents a real opportunity for the very worst people on earth. And that is where you and I come in, Billy, because our business is the very worst people on earth. I don't like when you said all those things and then opportunity. It's opportunity. just immediately it's like, well, that wasn't a word I was thinking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh. So, yeah, there's a whole industry out there, as I'm sure you're aware, to sell people bogus cancer cures. And uh, um, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll be doing some episodes in the near future talking about Black Sav and all these other terrible things that people sell on Facebook to cure each other's cancers. But today... I thought we would talk with the man who invented the modern fake cancer cure industry, a fellow named Harry Hoxie. Have you ever heard of Harry Hoxie? No, I haven't. I would remember that name, too. That's a good, yeah, it's yeah. catchy. Yeah, H-O-X-S-E-Y. Um, <laughs> yeah. So Harry Hoxie might be the guy, might be the greatest of the cancer con men. And that's that's who we're going to talk that about. That was today, on his Billy. business card. Harry Hoxie, cancer con. Yeah, <laughs> cancer con man. Yeah, <laughs> I'll kill you, cancer, but not really. <laughs> that I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah. Harry M. Hoxie, uh, the M stands for metastasize, was born on October 23rd, 1901, Auburn, Illinois. So we're already off to a bad start. Just in the middle of nothing. The middle of goddamn nothing. And I, I fucking spent some early years in Glen Carbon, so I can say that about Illinois. Yeah. It's, it's nothing. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing. He was the youngest of 12 children, and we do not know much about his parents, really. But we can safely assume that they loved to fuck. That's what uh, I was going to say. I was like, they <laughs> like to fuck. <laughs> they like to fuck. Because you don't get yeah. pregnant every time. No, and you don't get 12 kids who all make it out of that hole alive in that day and age without, like... 
put in the effort. Really, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, you put in the time, exactly. Yeah, he's sowing his fields. <laughs> yeah, he sure is. <laughs> Harry's father, John, owned a livery stable, which was essentially the gas station of the day. And he also worked as a veterinary surgeon. Uh, this did not, does not mean that <laughs> he was... just <laughs> two different... I'm a, gas I station a, surgeon. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you where do you take your horse? Ah, uh, this guy owns a gas station. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he does brain surgery on horses. <laughs> it's actually worse than that. Um, so yeah, the fact that he was a veterinarian does not mean he was a learned man. Um, his license to practice pet medicine was granted under the grandfather clause of the Illinois Medical Practice Act of 1877. So in 1877, Illinois was like, there's too many people saying these doctors who ain't doctors. And now if you're going to say you're a doctor, you got to have a medical license. But it was one of those things like, you know, when people talk about like banning assault rifles and they're like the ones who aren't like Beto O'Rourke are like, we'll let you keep your gun they'll be grandfathered in they kind of did the same thing with people who weren't doctors but had been working as doctors prior to 1877 they're like yeah you can keep saying it if you've been you doing can it. keep saying you're a doctor yeah <laughs> okay this is easier yeah. than arguing with all of you guys yeah we'll just let you keep being fake doctors <laughs> compromise is the necess is the the undergirding of democracy billy it is it is <laughs> So, Harry Hoxie's dad was not a doctor, but got to keep pretending to be a veterinary doctor because he'd been doing it for so long, um, even though his qualifications didn't really extend far beyond having a saw. Now, it's an, okay, it is an interesting position where, like, you can't mm-hmm. say you're a doctor anymore. I'm like, I've been being a doctor for a long time. I've been to... <laughs> what? Who says I'm not a doctor? There were all these I've been saying say, it so long. All these people say they call me doc. So, I feel like I said I have a, as a doctor about as long time as it'll take to get a medical degree. But you've killed a lot of people. Well, like, but most of them was horses. He's got a point. Just let him be. Let's just move on. There's like so many counties we have to go to. It's just. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's general, basically how it worked out. So. <laughs> Hoxie's dad, John, was a was a, a veterinarian, but not really. But legally, he was. And decades later, in the 1950s, Hoxie would claim that his family's knowledge of the healing arts went back even further. Uh, he started to claim that in 1840, his grandfather, John Hoxie, a horse breeder, had a prize stallion that developed a huge cancerous lesion. John had put the horse out to pasture and waited for it to die. But then the beast found a clump of shrubs and plants and just spent days eating them, almost exclusively. And to John's shock, the animal healed oh wow okay yeah okay and this is this is not impossible there mm-hmm. are cases in scientific literature of animals seeking out medicinal herbs on their own to 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 deal with problems mm-hmm. it does happen mm-hmm. so the story goes that john watched his prize horse cure itself uh and then he went out and he gathered up all the herbs that had been revealed to him by what he called horse sense <laughs> that's <laughs> that's the key to good medicine that is I mean, if someone was pitching that to me and they were like, horse sense, I'd be like, okay, go on. Okay. okay. I'm <laughs> going to hear this out. keep hearing this. <laughs> yes. Yeah, see, see Billy and Dr. Horse, uh, the hit Netflix uh, miniseries coming to your <laughs> streaming service. This, I want October. a horse around until he looks at some grass and I'm like, mm-hmm. eat that. Yeah, the horse is just squeezing on a baster to shoot bleach up people's assholes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't um, do it. The horse did it. <laughs> yeah. The, ain't no law that says a horse can't illegally practice bleach this medicine. This is Reverend Dr. Ed. <laughs> so, uh, uh, John Hoxie Sr. Uh, turns this horse sense medicine into a salve, and he starts using it on all of his other sick animals. Uh, and over the years, he, has a he lot found of it, sick animals. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that does, that does track. Yeah. Uh, and over the years, he found it was very effective at treating cancer, sores, and other illnesses in his herd. His salve was so effective that other people began seeking out his help for their sick animals. And that, Harry Hoxie would later claim, is how his dad ended up as a vet. So, I mean, it is just the most farmer bullshit you've ever heard, though. Aspects of it scan. Yes. I'll say that. Yeah. Aspects oh, of it scan. Without yeah. a doubt. Yes. I've, yeah. Uh, many of tobacco spit was put on my beasties. Oh, yeah. Like, that's... And 
It worked. I don't know how there, it worked. It did fucking work. Though, no, there is it. actually. Tobacco has medicinal benefits. Native Americans used it to keep away certain insects for thousands of years, and it, it can be used in that. Although tobacco spits not the ideal way I to do that. I understand that. that. Yeah. yeah no, as I got older, I was like, you could have just used the tobacco, I think. You yeah, you could have just put some spit. Yeah, rubs, yeah. <laughs> you did that to spit on me. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, that's the thing about Southern medicine. If it can be spit on you, it will be spit it's on you. It's more fun. It's a it's mm-hmm, a funner mm-hmm. delivery device. It is. They're not wrong about everything. No, no. <laughs> no they're, they're usually right about all the fun yeah. stuff. <laughs> so Harry's grandfather handed his recipe down to his son, and from the age of eight, he began to help out in his dad's business. But as often happens, the passes of generations brought with it change. Harry's grandfather had been content to use his miracle cure on animals, but Harry's father decided. Fuck it. Why not try this stuff out on random human beings with cancer? Mm-hmm. They ain't no different <laughs> than animals. <laughs> it cures what I'm pretty sure is horse cancer. It'll <laughs> cure what I'm pretty sure is people cancer. Rub it on your head. <laughs> For years, the Hoxies successfully cured all kinds of cancers with the magic of horse science until John Hoxie died in 1919. Uh. As the story goes, on his deathbed, Harry's father gave him the recipe for making the special family salve. He told his son, now you have the power to heal the sick and save lives. Why? He did that on the deathbed? Yeah, on his he deathbed. He saved that yeah. at the end. He was like, hey. Yeah, right at the end. Here's how you here's make the it. Ticket, here's the ticket to saving all mankind with the salve. Yep. Yep. You wait until your deathbed for that one. <coughs> <laughs> Two teaspoons. <coughs> wait, is that... Do you say table? Tea, is that a tablespoon? Is that... Oh, no. That's the dumbest... God damn it. We're all it this is obviously, obviously a lie. It's all so <laughs> yeah. blatant. I think that's... Yeah. When and I we'll, see we'll it like, get go into, big like yeah. that, that's when I'm like... We, ah. Yeah. We'll get into why exactly this, like, how this lie came about later. Obviously, it is a lie. We know this for a number of reasons. But the most obvious of the fact is that Harry's story changed wildly over the years. (laughs) Before publishing his biography, You Don't Have to Die, in 1956, Harry claimed that his father had developed the salve on his own in 1908. Uh, The versions of the story Harry told also tended to leave out the critical fact of how his father died. Cancer. <laughs> uh, yeah, his mother also died of cancer in 1921. Now, but not Billy, horse folks, cancer. None, not horse them, cancer. They did not die of horse cancer. Some folks might suggest that a cancer cure that failed to save both the curer's mother and father might not be a cancer cure. But let's be fair. Mechanics still get flat tires. You know, personal trainers put on a couple extra pounds around the holidays. You, 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 it's unreasonable to hold every cancer cure to the standard of actually curing cancer. Yes. Yes, yes that is unreasonable. Yeah. You're was, not going to have any magical cancer cures then. But I mean, <laughs> how are flea markets going to really exist? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, very fair. Think of small business owners <laughs> like Harry Hoxie. Now, the reality of, of Harry's backstory seems to be that he quit school at age 15 and started working as a coal miner. <laughs> <laughs> He later moved on to selling insurance. <laughs> that's a good leap. That is a good leap. That is a good <laughs> right into a desk job. Yeah, that's the that's the change you want to make. You know what? Yeah. My next job is not going to be this, I tell you much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, he completed a high school correspondence course after studying at night for three years. And it is not usually explained why Harry didn't go right into his father's line of business. Perhaps he was just drawn to the raw erotic appeal of coal mining. Whatever the case, Harry would later claim that he didn't start using the formula on his own until 1922, the year after his mother's death. So, huh. I do. I mean, claim. do you think it is that like teenage rebellion? He's like, I ain't going into bullshit and like, yeah, you. I got- <laughs> I'm going into real work. And then he went and did real work, and he's like, man, bullshit oh, ain't is so much. I better. see why Dad has a fake cancer cure. You know, yep. yeah. <laughs> That's he must have tried real work one time too. You know, I'm going to be honest. If 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 there's one thing having a podcast it's taught me, it's that I probably could have had a fake cancer cure in the 1900s and made a good living. And if it had been a choice between coal mining or fake cancer cure, I probably would have been a fake cancer doctor. I come from be honest farmers, with you. and I'm a stand-up comedian. <laughs> so, because I think people were like, oh, did yeah. you not know how to... I was like, no, I know how to do all that stuff. I just... <laughs> yeah, that- don't I choose to be to. a stand-up comedian. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, so I bet you're wondering <laughs> what was the inciting incident that brought Harry Hoxie into the business of using his dad's fake horse sense cancer cure. I can't. I don't want to. <laughs> he met a Civil War veteran who had I mean, cancer of the lip. He, <sighs> now, this veteran had found Harry, and I'm going to give you one guess as to which side of the war he wound up on. Right. This veteran found I didn't, Harry. I didn't, I didn't even. <laughs> there was no. There was no. Like, oh, I wonder which side. It never. It always. Oh, he's <laughs> Not even a question. Mm -hmm. No, he's he's wearing a specific shade of gray. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know which one he is. <laughs> Uh, now, this Civil War veteran found Harry through a trail of myths about the boy's cancer-curing family. Desperate, he begged the young man for a treatment. Harry very apologetically told the sick man that he could do nothing. He didn't have a medical license, and that sort of thing was required now. According to Harry, the veteran responded with this line. Nobody needs a license to save lives. If I was drowning, would you stand by and watch me go down? Because a sign on yonder tree says no swimming allowed? fucking bulletproof logic i mean if it depends on if i knew you or not <laughs> mm -hmm. it i mean it's like yeah actually most professionals will say you shouldn't just if you don't have training swim in there after a dress why so no. many people die because one person starts drowning and then like three other young men will run in after him and they'll all drown it yeah. happens every year constantly <laughs> now in his recitations of the story, Harry claimed, there's no adequate answer to that kind of logic, and I didn't waste any time in trying to find one. Instead, he set right to using his magical horse medicine on the dying veteran's cancer. The cancer was cured, and for years afterwards, the veteran would claim, primarily through newspaper articles, that he had been healed. And it's probably at this point that we should talk about what precisely was in the Hoxie's formula. Now, the actual formula that he used throughout his career varied constantly and, and included wild differences. One of the versions of it included like this, I think it was Bloodroot is the name, which is like, it's a, it's a similar kind of compound to what you would put on a wart. You know, you put those, okay. those like salicetic and it'll burn the wart off. Yeah. So one of the different formulations of the salve was that. And that sort of a compound can work on skin cancer sometimes it usually doesn't and it's generally so like the 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 different types of like different formulations that come up are so like vary so much that you can't rely on them to cure the cancer but it can be used to treat cancers and more to the point like people back in those days had like goiters and a bunch of weird skin things that would just like pop up on yeah. your body that weren't actually cancers and a compound like that an escherotic compound like that can burn those things off so it is entirely possible this guy had some weird lump that a doctor who wasn't really a doctor because it was fucking 19 and dot mm -hmm. like said was cancer this guy burned it off and the guy was like he cured me yeah like, it just looked gross and the doctor's like whoa that's cancer god yeah damn. now yeah. the most common recipe in the modern day you will see given for Hoxie's formula is a mix of licorice, red clover, burdock root, stalingia root, barberry cascara, prickly ash bark, and buckthorn bark. And this was not a recipe unique to his father or his father's father's horse. Similar formulas existed in various medicinal guides at around the same time and it was very first described in 1898. So, whatever debatable health properties you want to attribute to Hoxie's tonic, it definitely wasn't invented by his family. It's a thing people had been using for a very long time, and it's not even what he used all the time. He basically just mixed up whatever the fuck he wanted most of the time. And then, I, yeah, and then yeah. went into sales mode. Went into sales mode. It was yeah. all about the sales to Hoxie, as opposed to like what he was actually selling, because that varied over the years. So do you think his dad believed in it, and he was just more of like a... This is I am... I am not convinced his dad ever had any kind of cancer salve. I think he made that up too, but it's possible. Oh, you think it his is, dad was made? No, you think he made yeah. up that his dad did it? Yeah, like I, I fucking make a medicinal salve that I have given away to a couple of friends over the years for like, it's good for like, you know, we've used it for um like dogs that have like a raw spot on them to stop them from gnawing on it. And like, it's good for, it, it's got stuff, like everything in it is something that like I can point to double blind studies that have been conducted and show that like Plantago Major does this or like, and like that was even more common back in the day. Like you live out in the middle of nowhere. There's no mm -hmm. fucking doctors. Everybody's got some weird little remedy they use. So it's entirely possible that Hoxie's dad had had an actual herbal remedy that he read out of some book that his son started lying about and saying was a cancer cure too. Gotcha. Like, who knows what happened? Yeah. Any number of things could have occurred. 
as we'll get into, what matters is less what Hoxie was using to cure cancer and more how Hoxie marketed his cancer cure that did not cure cancer. And I want to make that really clear. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. So after, quote unquote, curing his first patient, Hoxie partnered up with two Chicago men to form the National Cancer Research Institute, a common law trust with the goal of exploring his father's magical salve. For some unknown reason, these Chicago men backed out very quickly, and Hoxie alone <laughs> expanded his operations into the Hoxide Institute, which he launched in the town of Taylorville. Now, these facilities were the old headquarters of the Order of the Moose, which is... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Billy and I just gave each other the look like oxide, and then you said moose, yeah, and now I know Billy, Billy can't make eye contact. It's just all of it. It's like, <laughs> just, I, I, yeah, it's a con man. I, like everywhere I, he goes, yeah. And I, I know Illinois is technically part of the Midwest. You know, we're kind of right on, right, right in that Mason Dixon line area. But I'm going to declare it part of the South just based on this story. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, like from like Peoria down is yeah. The once south. you get yeah eh, yeah the southern part of Illinois yeah no without I mean a doubt. you're damn near Missouri yeah yeah so Jeez. yeah <laughs> the, the fucking order of the moose so he sets up his headquarters in the old order of the moose building which he buys with the help of unnamed businessmen in town who he convinced somehow to give him a pile of money now. Hoxie began publishing advertisements for the Hoxide Institute. Next, uh, they featured the word cancer in large, bold letters, followed by this copy. Any person suffering from this malady is invited to apply for authoritative information as to the cures that have been affected and are now being affected at Taylorville under strictly ethical method medical supervision, painlessly, without operation, and with permanent results. <laughs> Those are, yeah. <laughs> strictly ethical. Yeah. We gotta, we gotta emphasize that. No, that doesn't make alarm bells go off when you have to say that in your pitch. No, nah, this no. is ethical. And this like, well, is strictly you... ethical. Yeah. Why would it not yeah. be? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how you know something's ethical. How would you know something's ethical if people didn't repeatedly tell you that they aren't con men? It makes me trust them. It makes me trust them. Mm -hmm. Now, interested parties, most of whom were either cancer patients or their relatives, began to inquire soon, and the Hoxide Institute was quickly filled with patients. Next, according to a wonderful book, The Medical Messiahs by James Harvey Young, quote, shortly the local paper began to run stories of deaths that were occurring at the Institute. Ugh. Local doctors began to be concerned. One of them wrote the high priests at the American Medical Association telling of examining a man who had received the Hoxide treatment. The paste had been applied to a tumor on the cheek. Two days before the man died, the doctor wrote, I was called to see him and found necrosis of not only soft tissue of his face, but a complete destruction of the malar bone. The man died of hemorrhage at the hospital and well, this is where we yeah was he just giving him like acid jesus Christ. yeah that's th that's what i was saying one of the formulations of the salve that hoxie used was basically it's very similar to this stuff black salve that you see sold all over like facebook and shit today um it's a compound that burns your skin off and people will lie and say it only targets cancer skills it burns everything and you can potentially use types of this to burn off very specific types of skin cancer it's it's it can work but the problem is that none of these people know what they're doing and they over apply it and apply it way too strongly and apply it on cancers that it can't help with and a lot of times if you just keep applying this it will eat through to the fucking bone yeah like it's um uh, it's like, you know, a, a, an amputation can potentially be a necessary medical treatment. If you use it for every potential illness, you're not helping anybody. Yeah, yeah. That's this an is that kind hair, of thing. Like, cut it yeah. off. Cut it off. <laughs> like, you know, you think about, like, a lot of this stuff, like, goes back to ancient Native American remedies. And if you're in fucking the year 1500 BC and you've got a skin cancer, yeah, this, like, this has, you, you, something like this will give you a better shot at survival than fucking nothing, right? Yeah, it yeah. might work. It did on some people. That's why they used it. But by the, this time, and, like, it's not the way to do things. And he's also not just using it on very specific kinds of skin cancer. He's just giving it to everybody who's sick. And so he winds up burning through a lot of people's skulls. Cool. It's cool. Yeah. I like it's that doctors stuff. are like, hey, we should do something about that, right? <laughs> yeah, they start to. They start to be like, this seems to be a problem that he keeps dissolving the skulls of people in town. <laughs> Don't. We should. 
Should we meet up about that? Yeah, should we? Should there be a thing we do when people start melting skulls? As a medical professional, that's not good. Now, it is 1924, and none of us are good at being doctors, but I feel like this is worse. All of us that have the license should be able to agree, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, to keep the secret of his medicine, uh, the, the doctor said, Hoxie bought the separate ingredients each at a different drugstore. The key ingredient, analysis at AMA headquarters revealed, was arsenic. Ah. Thus, Hoxie's vaunted remedy was an escherotic, a corrosive chemical that ate away the flesh. Through the ages, physicians had employed such corrosive agents in treating external cancers. But this mode of procedure had become outmoded. Pastes went out with the bustle. A met cancer authority has noted so far as scientific medicine is concerned such chemicals could not distinguish between tissues that were cancerous and tissues that were sound the risk of damage to healthy flesh was tremendous the escherotic might eat into the blood vessels and cause death through bleeding surgery was much safer and more certain <laughs> so yeah. yeah yeah i agree with the last part yeah you know it's even safer and more certain than surgery billy wayne i got hunches Yep, yeah, it is the products and services that support this podcast. And I feel like the FDA will support us when we say that every one of these products cures cancer better than randomly applying arsenic to your face. I would I would put my name on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You absolutely. Sure? Well, yes. Maybe yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, not I my name. I will put Billy's no, name on that no, too. Put my name on it. Put a version yeah. of my name. Billy's name is Reverend on all of it. Reverend Doctor. Yes. Billy Wayne Davis. W- Billum. Yep. Billum Davis. No, Reverend. So wait, can... wait, 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 wait. Reverend Doctor Billionaire Wayne Davis. Yes, Billionaire Wayne Davis. <laughs> Perfect. Billionaire Wayne Davis. Well, help make Billy a billionaire by purchasing products from companies that are unrelated to him. Sir. We're back, and we are talking about Harry Hoxie's Burn Your Face Off Clinic uh, in Taylorville, Illinois. Um, Now, the AMA did not take all this sitting down. One doctor wrote a scathing report on the Hoxie Institute in the AMA Journal, writing that tragedy would befall cancer sufferers who are beguiled by the false beacons of the Hoxie University. The promoters of the scheme, he wrote, were reaping a rich harvest from gullibility and suffering, which is... Very well worded. And yeah. Accurate. Eloquent. Now, Hoxie responded in the way of all true expert charlatans. He sued the AMA for libel and demanded a quarter of a million dollars. Fuck you, pay me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I have to say, we're going to talk about this later. This is the first time someone's really done this. Um, that like one of these medical charlatans has taken the fight to the people trying to bust him in like an organized way. And he will he will continue to. He's not really the like like. um goat ball doctor um yeah. who we we will also talk about later is kind of doing this you know in, in a similar time frame frame but hoxie is on the cutting edge of establishing how to attack the medical establishment to secure your right to sell poison that is he's one of the founding fathers of that everything needs a pioneer i guess <laughs> everything needs a pioneer that's hey, a pioneering is always good doesn't matter what you are nope no nope, mm-hmm. you should be nope. rewarded for being the first Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be the pioneer just chopping off cancerous lesions real fucking fast I with bet, a machete. I bet that you're not even the first that's done that. No. If no, this but if being a guest of this podcast has taught me. I will not be the first, but I will be the fastest and the drunkest. <laughs> well, and that's something to be proud of. You might not be the drunkest either. <laughs> yeah, there's actually no way I will be the drunkest. <laughs> if all because the history there, I've read is correct. No, no you won't. No. No, I, I, if I can walk, I won't be as drunk as the average doctor in 1838. <laughs> or any of the founding fathers. <laughs> or any of the founding fathers. Oh, God. So, the case spent several years wandering through the courts before the AMA finally insisted it go to trial. And this seems to have been them calling Hoxie's bluff. He did never want the court case to go to trial. He just wanted to be able to constantly raise money off of talking about this case that he was fighting. And the AMA was like, no, let's fucking go to court. Um, and he's and like, so no, he was, that's not what we're doing. Yeah. No. He was kind of shocked to wind up in court, uh, and he was not actually prepared for a lawsuit and did not have any of the things ready that he needed to have ready, and so the judge dismissed his claims. Uh, perhaps his lawyers were distracted, because at the same time, they were fighting a lawsuit brought against Toxie by the family of one of his dead patients. So... 
Accused of practicing medicine without a license, Harry pled guilty and received a hundred dollar fine. This would be one of dozens of convictions for practicing medicine That's without it. a license. That's it. Huh? What? That's all he got? Yeah, a hundred dollars. I mean, it's a lot of money back then. Nah, it's not. He's it doing, is not he enough. He did a lot of no. murders is what he did. Yeah. He got away with he murder absolutely for a hundred dollars. Yeah. Yeah, it's more money than, but it is, you're right, absolutely not enough to sh- stop him from his behavior. No, like, it doesn't even slow him down. No, no, because no, no. you don't have to pay it. Yeah, I mean, you could say it does have an impact because he's forced to close the Hawkside Institute in 1928 after just four years. So, like, you could argue, you know, it, it, it did something, um, but it did not stop Harry's dream of curing cancer with horse medicine. He immediately founded another cancer institute in Jacksonville. And when this was shut down, he tried the chat town of Girard, Illinois, where he'd grown up. Somehow, he managed to call on the town Chamber of Commerce into letting him celebrate his return home with Hoxie Day, a 4th of July-like celebration with the <laughs> town band playing and a small crowd of grateful patients giving their loud testimonials. He's got a fellow Moxie. Dis- he does mm-hmm. have Hoxie. Yeah, Ho- he has Ho- Moxie. has got Moxie. He does mm-hmm. have Moxie. He's- he does. If only he had actually been selling Moxie, which is, of course, a, a, a mixture of MIPT and MDMA that is a delightful way to spend an evening. Um, okay, I'll take it. Okay. Yeah, it, it fucking rules. Um, yeah. So a fellow who is described in the literature as an eclectic doctor from Indiana <laughs> praised Hoxie's salve. Well, that's what they called Larry Bird, too. So. <laughs> yeah. The eclectic doctor. The eclectic Um, doctor from Indiana. And a local minister delivered a speech that praised Harry Hoxie as a figure of near religious character. I love my country because its heroes are such characters as George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Woodrow Wilson, who love to serve but not to rule. I love Hoxie because he does not want to rule the world but serve the world. No. That's a great speech. It is a good speech. (laughs) And it's just, God, if you just get a good performer, mm-hmm. you, there's, uh, it's all you need. It really is. It's, you, it's remarkable. Yeah. And just, just don't get too full of yourself. You could do that forever. Yeah. Now, with this preamble complete, Hoxie took up the stage to address his once and future neighbors. Quote from Hoxie. There is a lot of knockers who do not know what they're talking about, and especially around a man's hometown, if those knockers are here today and have the mind of a six-year-old child and don't leave here today, a walking, talking, dyed-in-the-wool Hoxie fan and convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that this treatment is a cure for cancer, they are either deaf, dumb, or blind, or else they are crazy. I'm not going to say that word. With knockers? My accent. No, not with my mm-hmm. accent. Nope. Not going to say knocker? Oh, yep. You know what? Yep. Nope. Good nope. call. <laughs> mm-hmm. Love my career and my children. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as you said that, I was like, yeah, sitting this one out. Everyone, y'all have fun playing. I'll be over here. Yeah. After warming up the crowd with some random insults, Hoxie zeroed in on attacking the medical establishment, declaring so-called real doctors with licenses hard-hearted and only interested in having their hand greased with plenty of money so they could buy fancy cars. He noted that he'd invited the AMA to this rally, but that they'd refused to attend. Why don't they fight in the open? Why don't they take this platform? Why don't they prove the Hoxie affair is as fake as they say? Look at but you no over friends. there being doctors curing things. <laughs> Why won't you come to my parade and tell me my burning treatment don't cure cancer? Say it to my face. Say it to my face. Say it to these dead people's burnt off faces. <laughs> yeah. You got to work hard to find what's left of the faces, but it's in there. They're, say it to them. Yeah. You're going to have to shout it because of the ears and the burning. <laughs> but there's no cancer. <laughs> Now, the AMA was in fact aware of all this, but letters written internally at the time show they basically concluded that the best thing to do was let Hoxie run his little clinic for a while. They felt it would soon become clear that his treatment was worthless and then he'd be run out of town. This is an ethically dubious approach, but it kind of worked, and Hoxie soon found himself fleeing Gerard. It does sound like an Andy Griffith approach to it. Yeah, this is exactly how Andy Griffith would handle it. Yeah, that's an Andy Griffith Mm -hmm. that were like, just... It'll get around. He's burning people's it, faces. Yeah, he uh, folks will figure out pretty soon. <laughs> they dumb, but they ain't that dumb. Barney comes back in half his face. He's like, "You're yeah, right, Barney Andy. Would, <laughs> I ain't got a face." 
<laughs> yeah, that, that would be the first act of the sh- of the episode. It's Barney <laughs> yes. getting his face burned off. We yeah. gotta get his face back. Yeah. <laughs> Now, Hoxie was fined twice more in Illinois for practicing medicine without a license. As an instinctive grifter, Harry Hoxie knew exactly two things. Number one, the key to grifting is to never, ever admit defeat. And number two, the second key to grifting is to move somewhere with fewer laws if the laws keep getting in the way of your con. <laughs> that's, really, that's really everything about grifting. <laughs> Solid. <laughs> but as we've learned, they all don't stick to those rules. They do not stick to those rules, and that is what what damns them in the end. Mm -hmm. But this is not the end. So, very next, Hoxie moved his cancer clinic to the Mexico of Illinois. Oh, oh, okay, the Iowa. Mexico. I was like, no, he didn't go no, to Mexico. No, no, okay. no, 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 not yet. He goes to the Mexico of Illinois, which is, of course, Iowa. Um, and he teamed up with another random do- guy there, another fake doctor, who thought he could cure cancer, and the two worked together briefly until the state of Iowa realized what was going on and forbade Hoxie from treating cancer patients ever again. So, actually, Iowa uh, handles this very well. Um, I just, I can't not make fun of Iowa, and mm-hmm. I'm not going to change. They yeah. deserve it. Yeah. They deserve it. Just, it's pretty. But. There's not a single state in this union I will not mock, except for Montana, um, because I am frightened of it. Yeah, and it's awesome. Yeah. It, it is awesome. Yeah, it rules. Um, yeah. That is another reason. Yeah. Now, this began a period of travel for Harry Hoxie. He moved to Detroit. And then Wheeling, West Virginia, and then Atlantic City, setting up cancer clinics and having them almost immediately busted. The AMA followed him the whole way. and he It's hard to get con- busted in West Virginia for anything. It, it's a fucking Billy the Kid's hometown. Like, yeah. It's hard to get. Yeah. It's hard for those people to be like, hey, come on now. We're West Virginia, and you went a step too far That's, for us. Come on. We, we've made it mandatory for six-year-olds to carry handguns, but this is a step this beyond is, what we're comfortable you with. You can't be burning people's <laughs> face off. Get out of here. Now, the AMA followed him the whole way, and he accumulated convictions for practicing medicine without a license at the normal rate men accumulate Twitter suspensions. By 1936, Harry Hoxie was tired of getting constantly, almost immediately caught and law slammed by the medical establishment. He decided to head to the most lawless, vile, hateful, wretched, and untrustworthy city in the United States of America, the one place where a medical con man like him could truly thrive. I'm talking, of course... About Dallas, Texas. Hmm. Maybe. Yeah. 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 That scans. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot. A lot. It's mostly ego in that yeah. that city. So yeah. You can, yeah. That's. Oh, ripe. so you've met my brother. <laughs> it is right. You can get away picking. with everything in Dallas, <laughs> yes, Texas. You can. It yeah. is. It's comical. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that leads. I mean, the Chamber of Commerce, the modern Chamber of Commerce's motto is Dallas, Texas. You can get away with it here. Come on in. Yeah. This isn't a joke. This is just the truth of Dallas, Texas. I would say eighty percent of the crimes I've committed in my life have been in Dallas, Texas, and <laughs> no consequences. This is so funny. <laughs> it's a great town. Yeah. <laughs> it is fun. It is. Fun. We should now, go there. For it does tour. feel like it's like. Texas Vegas is we what should, it is. We need to do a show in yeah. Dallas for all the reasons that just got listed. Yeah, we'll we'll do a show in Dallas and I'm sure commit a couple more crimes there. Um, now, for the actual work of spreading horse medicine on dying people, uh, Harry turned to a handful of homeopathic, osteopathic, and eclectic doctors. These were people who had medical licenses, so it was not illegal for them to practice non-medicine on cancer patients. And you'd think that with a situation like this, like this is pretty sweet gig for a guy like Harry Hoxie, you'd think he'd be able to avoid getting in more trouble for practicing medicine without a license. But in the great tradition of medical conmen, Harry possessed a deep and uncontrollable need to really just get his hands in there, you know? <laughs> yeah, just, uh-huh. yeah, they do. They do have that <laughs> need. Yeah. You can't stop them. You can't stop them. It Even is. when they don't need to, when they're already rich. They can't. Do it. They fucking yeah. can't. It is. And Ah. It's the it's the thing that's most confusing about these guys. Obviously, they are mostly just vile con men who want to make a shitload of money um, and don't care if it works or not. That's a factor. But there has to be an element of belief or something that makes them want to do it themselves. Like there's there's something else going on. It is it's a not purely mercenary thing. Yeah, I, 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 I'm with you because there is that thing of like, I'll fucking do this. Where you're like, oh, I can fucking fix this. Yeah, like, you, I don't. I, you can't. 
No, There's you, states you absolutely us, cannot. You can't. <laughs> Multiple states. Like, you've gone through like half of them at this point. <laughs> like, a lot of the country. <laughs> you keep killing people. He's like, no, the cancer does. He's like, no, you've sped it up. Yeah, you really, really made it faster. That is... Uh, but there is yeah. something I also love that every state he goes to, there's like, he always teams up with a new person. So there that's is like, a key, though. That cracks me up because I like to think of that moment where they both realize, like, wait, you're a full of shit, too. I'm mm-hmm. a full of shit. You want to? Yeah. Should we make more money off of this? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Harry was caught practicing medicine without a license and fined $25,000 and given a five-month sentence in jail. And especially compared to his first penalty mm-hmm. for That's practicing good. medicine without a license, this is a pretty, pretty reasonable penalty. Uh, sure it's at like, least a good damn, start. Damn. But Harry was still, uh, he was practicing in Texas. Uh, and even though Texas levied this nice fine on him, he was able to appeal the fine to a higher court within the state who decided... What are we doing punishing this guy? He seems nice. Get out of jail, you scamp. So Texas was the right place to move, in other words. Uh, Harry was able to avoid future issues of getting convicted of practicing medicine without a license by convincing the American Naturopathic Association to award him an honorary Doctor of Naturopathy degree. Degree. And it's kind of hard for me to figure out exactly how this happened. I've done a bit of digging, which suggests that this honorary status at the time was conferred upon people who made $10 donations to the association. Ah. So, <laughs> it may have been that easy. I don't know. Um, it may have been that easy. Well, judging by his background, he is that clever yeah. where he was like, what is this? 10 bucks? Okay. Shit. Hell yeah. 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 Now, like it also might have been a situation a where they came to him and offered him the honorary degree because he was so prominent within like this natural medicine community that was really in like the 30s and 40s starting to grow into a thing. So they might have reached out to him because he was so prominent. I really don't know. Um, now, at this point, though, we should talk a little bit about naturopathy. Uh, the term was coined by a guy named John Scheel in 1895, and John sold this word to <laughs> the father of naturopathy, a man named Benedict Lust. <laughs> All their na- Scheel, Lust... Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, Benedict Lust used the word naturopathy, which he had again purchased to found the word the, the American School of Naturopathy in 1901. This was reorganized in 1919 as the American Naturopathic Association. It grew rapidly up into the 1930s. Most states at this point were not willing to grant naturopaths licenses. And so at first, the only licensed naturopathic doctors were either in England or in the American West. Even after naturopathy suffered its first collapse as a discipline in the 1940s it remained incredibly prevalent in the pacific northwest and it is today i was gonna but say this it's, time, still, it's still going yeah, pretty strong up still there. a big deal yeah and at this time the southwest is like the heart of the naturopathy movement and yeah. texas has a hell of a lot of these people so modern naturopathy is not a subject within the bounds of this episodes and it's changed what it means over the years a fair amount but in the 1930s and in texas the term basically meant a doctor who doesn't want to follow all those rules other doctors follow which is you're right texas is the perfect place for the it's the perfect place that attitude oh god he's right yeah you're right it's perfect one of the things about being a Southerner is, and one of the things about being a libertarian, honestly, is that everything I love and everything I hate about both the South and libertarianism is bound up in each other. So, like, <laughs> what I love about the South is this, like, attitude of, like, leave me the fuck alone. Do not tell me what to do. I identify with that strongly. I, yes. I plan to live in the middle of nowhere very soon. Um, I I love that attitude, but it's also the attitude that gives you nonsense doctors. Yes. Because it's like, nobody should tell this guy he can't burn cancer off of people's faces. Yes. And it's, yeah. And it yep. takes another person like that to look and be like no 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 that that guy's full of shit that's a bad idea guys yeah, we shouldn't be doing this yeah. like as a as a fuck you kind of person that guy's a bad fuck you kind of person yeah yeah and it, it's just this kind of thing that like you just can't trust the free market to sort this shit out no because the free market has no problem with this guy making a fuckload of money lighting people's faces on fire with acid well yeah. the free market is trying to make their own money so we're not looking mm-hmm. at what you're doing 
That's that's no. why regulation. Okay, we're yeah. Yeah, we it's why the this. AMA is a good thing to exist, yes. despite some flaws that it has. Um, and especially in this period, the uh, the AMA is really doing the Lord's work of trying to stop this shit. Whew. So. Uh, while Hoxie started his Dallas practice, it was this was right at the time that medicine was in the throes of what's known as the chemotherapeutic revolution. So chemotherapy has just become a thing at this point, and it brought hope to countless cancer sufferers. And it still does. But chemo, yeah, it still does. But no. chemo is also really fucking unpleasant to receive, and it was even worse in the 1930s. It's a shitty thing to have to go through, even though it absolutely does save a huge number of lives. Um, but horrible stories about painful chemo treatments that had a lower success rate than they do today helped to drive new customers to Hoxie's practice where he treated them with his horse medicine. Um, so yeah, this is, you can see how one feeds into the other. Yeah. And it's yeah. not, it's just, and what sucks is like these, it's not a lot of dum dums going to him. It's just people that are like, just help. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, just please help me. And a lot of them are folks who like, you know, cancer treatment was even more primitive. A lot of them there are people there probably was nothing science could do to help them. Yeah. Um, so they go to him in desperation and he makes their last months even worse, you know? Yeah. And we'll talk about what a lot of his patients were too, because it's even more complicated than that. But Billy, you know what's even better than chemotherapy? Oh yeah, a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. Capitalism therapy, buddy capitalism therapy yeah, that's debatable that was not it'll reduce the the kind you know a, a full wallet is a kind of metastatic tumor billy i've and never felt it <laughs> <laughs> capitalistic therapy will get rid of that tumor in your wallet it's time for an ad break services we're back so uh, the early years of Harry Hoxie's wandering practice had involved him mostly using that paste that burnt off cancers. And he primarily treated like stuff like those weird like lip cancers and goiters and weird shit mm -hmm. like that that uh, like like that veteran came in with. And he also treated a lot of breast cancer and unfortunately, a lot of ovarian cancer and other external cancers. <sighs> now, part of why he had a lot of positive testimonials from patients is that much of what he treated was not cancer. A lot of it was warts and lumps and things people thought might be cancer. And he would tell them it was cancer and then he would burn it off and most of these people would wind up being fine. And so it's like, ah, yeah, I saved your life. I cured your fucking cancer. It was in Dallas that Hoxie first began claiming that he could treat internal cancers, too. And this evolution was probably a direct reaction to chemotherapy. So now uh, chemotherapy okay. is claiming it can treat internal cancers. Hoxie's going to start He's treating like, internal cancers, Fuck you, cancers me too. too. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Uh, so most of his, his, his mixtures varied, but most of them included a mix of water, potassium iodide, which is generally used to loosen mucus, an herbal laxative called cascara, sugar, and a few other herbs. So taking it would absolutely provoke a physical response, you know, um, mm -hmm. which is part of how people feel like they're, oh, I'm purging, you know, all this toxic stuff. So he's kind of the first guy to realize that if you just make people shit a bunch, they'll feel like they're healing. <laughs> that is, yeah, I mean. That's what a good yeah. hangover does, too. If you Absolutely. Just, if you shit about you, you're like, I am yeah. healed. The poison is yeah. getting out. That's yeah. <laughs> all those uh, skinny tea scams that mm -hmm. influencers are do are that. I was just thinking of shit that. Shit your that, way to health. That cleanse. What is it? You put the. In, you just. Mm -hmm. It's literally just shit pills. Yeah, that's what it mm -hmm. is. Yeah. yeah. Where you eat a bunch of, or it's you just a drink scam. a bunch of syrup and shit. And you're like, no, mm -hmm. that's just. Yeah. You're just. Shit your way to better health. Flushing your system. Yeah, and not eating for days so that you get like those quick, you know, uh, those quick results that don't actually stay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, he also had a medication he would give people that was basically just Pepto-Bismol, which was a common medication at the time. Um, Hoxie prescribed it to deal with the nauseating effects of his other mixture. So some of these drugs did have medicinal effects, but none of them cured cancer. And I'm going to quote again from the book, The Medical Messiahs. 
Why has colored mixtures cured cancer? Hoxie and his spokesman were frank to confess they did not completely know. We have been too busy treating cancer victims and fighting court battles to keep our clinic open, he asserted in his autobiography, to spare the time, personnel, and facilities for objective study. His hypothesis, in its bluntest version, held that a major chemical imbalance in the body caused normal cells to mutate into a cancerous form, and his medicines restored the original chemical environment, checking and killing the cancerous cells. This hypothesis could be elaborated at length, as in an address delivered to Hoxie's medical director, into a complicated fantasy of irrelevant scientific and pseudoscientific jargon that sounded very impressive to the layman, but caused genuine cancer experts to grieve. <laughs> it makes things worse as the experts assess the ho- yeah. Just to grieve, to grieve. That yeah. means like that they, they felt like something just died. <laughs> yeah, they were exactly. Just like, God, this is bad. What? What made things worse, as the experts assessed the Hoxie theories, was that the Hoxie literature condemned the only treatments yet found valid in cancer therapy. And I really want to emphasize here what a pioneering grifter Harry Hoxie was. Generations of snake oil salesmen pioneered the fine art of lying about the efficacy of their own medication. The downside of this is the fact that it puts a lot of pressure on your treatment to actually work. Hoxie only promised a better than 50% success rate with his own treatment. Rather than trying to present it as a perfect pan, Panacea, he emphasized that it just had a higher success rates than conventional medicine. Hoxie's whole marketing strategy pivoted around a shit-talking real medicine rather than talking up his fake medicine. So that's cool. Wow. Yeah. He's... Uh, He's a genius. He. I mean, you're not wrong, but he doesn't use his powers for good. That's for sure. No. It's just... No. Yeah, it'd be, I mean, it'd be one thing if if he wasn't trying to discredit credible science, but then he wouldn't be successful. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like you look at right now uh, why alternative medicine and goop and all this shit is more is is like the biggest it's been in decades as an industry. It's because this fucking it's because like Facebook and shit have spread yeah. this welter of propaganda that has people less trusting of modern medical science than they ever have been. And other shit plays into that. The fact that we don't have universal health care, the fact that so like yeah. people are like going broke trying to get treated and like the whole medical system is this very unfriendly mess to get into and like all of the scammers are very friendly and nice and like all these different Facebook support groups where people share their stories about using bullshit medicine to treat themselves like and attack mainstream medicine at the same time. Like it's all Harry Hoxie is like the first guy to realize this and to try to do it, but it doesn't reach its apothesis until the internet really makes it possible to convince a bunch of people that doctors are all in on a scam. I mean, and it's great. <laughs> you look at the opioid epidemic too. Yeah. Just like you're talking about all those factors too. You're like, you look at all it, of it combined, you're like, oh, I yeah. Can see where it's just a fucking field day for this. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Great stuff. So. Uh, Part of how Harry Hoxie did this was by having his own medical professionals write papers and studies lambasting the mainstream medical uh, industry, or whatever you want to call it. His own medical director, J.B. Durkee, (laughs) gave lectures where he would claim, In my opinion, X-ray and radium have no place in the treatment of cancer. They upset basic cell metabolism rather than do anything to correct it. A printed version of Durkee's lecture was handed out to new patients in order to convince them that actual medicine would only make them sicker. New patients, generally sick and afraid, were first sat down with a clerk who wrote down their medical history. This included data on what their other actual doctors had told them. Records were requested, and then lab tests were carried out. From time to time, they even did biopsies and took x-rays. To prospective patients, the whole encounter at Hoxie's clinic would have felt very similar to a visit with their normal doctor. And this was another of Hoxie's great innovations, alternative medicine that looked from the outside just like regular medicine and it is this weird situation where like you have to convince people that regular doctors are full of shit and trying to scam them but you also the more like a regular doctor's office your office feels the more successful your con is going to be it's like a church that (laughs) opens a coffee shop exactly like a church that opens a coffee shop and then like hey man are you lost you're like yeah i am lost i am lost inside inside like, here's the cappuccino and some Jesus. 
Now, the dangerous nonsense didn't start until after a cancer diagnosis had been given to the patient, which of course was given in roughly 100% of cases. External (laughs) cancers were treated with burning agents. Internal cancers were given all sorts of weird liquids alongside a course of vitamins, laxatives, and antacids. Once the treatment was prescribed, the patient was taken to Hoxie's business manager. The standard fee started at $300, which was about $5,500 in modern money. God. Yeah. It's a good racket, man. It is a good racket. This worked extremely well, and soon Hoxie was making bank. The whole thing would have looked pretty reputable to most observers at the time. He only claimed around a 50-60% to success rate. Between the few surface cancers that were actually eradicated by this burning compound, and the fact that many of his patients didn't really have cancer, he had a lot of satisfied customers. And as the money rolled in, Harry Hoxie decided he had to innovate one more time by doing something (laughs) no medical grifter had ever done before. He attempted to get Congress on his side. No, I thought you were going to say he is going to raise someone from the dead. (laughs) No, no, no. They've all done that. Yeah. In 1945, he visited the National Cancer Institute in Washington, D.C., backed up by three congressmen who were believers in his therapy. The NCI had been created in 1935 with the goal of bringing serious resources to bear in the fight against cancer. Since the state of the field was more primitive back then, they were trying everything, and there was a willingness from within the NCI's doctors to see if there might be something to Hoxie's treatments, you know? It's a see, more primitive guys, we give Congress it a shot. Congress has always been corrupt and stupid and mostly stupid very corrupt but stupid Sh- is the dominant thing stupid They're yeah stupid. so dumb so unbelievably dumb it's not new like when people are like this is yeah. the end you're like no this is how it's always been you guys yeah I don't it, know they have been. always been exactly this du- things have always been exactly this dumb they're just faster now <laughs> and we just see it way more clear yeah that's true it is now, more clear in- than it has been it is yeah it is clear thankfully thanks to the work of pioneering journalists like the washington post who who put up great columns like why we need more elitism in politics I, finally <laughs> finally someone's yeah. saying it someone's brave enough to say it thank you so yeah he goes to the he, he gets he goes with these congressmen to the nci to like see if there's in and the doctors there are like yeah we'll, we'll take a look at your treatments why not uh and i'm going to quote from the medical messiahs uh to 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 discuss what happened next To avoid burdening the council with trivial and patently futile suggestions, criteria had been established to govern which methods of treating cancer among those proposed warranted investigation and possible testing. When Hoxie, the congressman in tow, showed up at the Institute, the NCI's director, Dr. R.R. Spencer, explained these criteria. The Institute, he said, would be glad to present Hoxie's case to the advisory council if he would furnish certain information. He must reveal his formula and explain his techniques of treatment in detail. He must also present a record of at least 50 50 cases treated by his method. Each case must represent an individual in whom the presence of internal cancer had been confirmed by competent biopsy, who had been treated by physicians and given up as hopeless, and who had then been treated by Hoxie and had survived from three to five years. Reasonable requirements, right? Seemingly. Yeah. And there was no chance that Hoxie was going to provide any of this. He did send the NCI 60 case studies, but their minimal review showed that none of his files were of any use at all. He hadn't documented any of the stuff he was re- supposed to document. They couldn't contact any of these people. It was just it was just like he basically was writing it on a piece of paper. I cured this guy. I cured this guy, too. <laughs> this guy's better. Fixed. Yeah. Fixed. Yeah. The NCI told him that he was going to need to provide them with much more information on his patients if they were going to review his treatment properly. And Hoxie decided that this was evidence that the NCI had been compromised by the vile beasts at the American Medical Association. He later wrote, I was bitterly disappointed, disillusioned, and shocked. That's that's my favorite part of anyone full of shit, is when someone like this hears their pitch out. In a in a nice way, we're like, hell yeah! What you got? What you got? Do the dance? What you got? And then they're like, and the the salesman's like, oh, we got these people. I'm like, cool, that sounds great. Now we just need you to answer these like very simple yeah, questions, very basic questions, very yeah. simple questions. And they're like, and the other person's like, how dare you? And you're like, okay, all right, that's what that's your move. All right, then we're done. That's so. It's ugh. Yeah, it's amazing. It rules. It rules, Billy. Is it pure ego? Is that what gets you to 
that room doing that. It's like the like it, it reminds me of the Casey Anthony thing where she walks him to the yeah. place she worked at and then just walked to the end of the wall and was like, I didn't really work here. I don't know. I, I think there's ego certainly involved, but I, I, I feel this is a colder scheme on his part. And I'll explain why. So he doesn't give up just because the NCI is like, well, you're <laughs> going to have to provide us with real evidence. Never assumed we'll, he was done. <laughs> yeah. Um, he goes to one of his pet congressmen next, a senator named Elmer Thomas of Oklahoma, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, one of Thomas's constituents, possibly planted by Hoxie, had went gone to Elmer and like raved about the fact that this guy's horse medicine had saved his son. And he'd urged Thomas to visit the clinic. And Senator Thomas obliged. He held a hearing transcribed by a court reporter where he questioned a number of patients that he'd let Hoxie select, who all told him positive stories of their treatment. He told the senator he was willing to put his medicine up to any kind of test. This was an empty promise. No test followed, and Hoxie had no intention of ever submitting to one. But he had what he wanted. This printed testimony written by a court reporter of an actual senator questioning his patients. He printed this up and published it as final proof of his pet treatment's efficacy. And he was able to be like, no, we went to the NCI and, you know, we've, we've submitted data to the NCI. So for the rest of the time, he could say like, oh, we sent them our data. Like, we're, we're trying to play ball here. It's the AMA that doesn't really want to look into what we're doing. It's part of, it's, it was all a scheme. And, uh, yeah. Smart. It's- always been going on yeah now there were of course lawsuits against hoxie from patients that his treatments had failed in the late 1940s he was sued by a widower who claimed that his wife's death had been caused by negligent treatment at hoxie's clinic this was probably true but hoxie's lawyers protected him he won two libel suits against morris fishbean the ama's anti-quack attack dog and the hero of our goat ball doctor episode Fishbean was absolutely correct when he called Hoxie a cancer charlatan in an article titled Blood Money, published in a major Hearst magazine. He argued that Harry's father had been a veterinarian and a dabbler in faith cures who died of cancer himself. Hoxie sued for a million dollars and won, but was awarded only two dollars, one for himself and one for his father. And... <laughs> the whole case is really weird. The judge seems to have believed Hoxie's claims about the efficacy of his treatment. So the judge is like dumb enough that he fell for this guy's lies. But he also acknowledged that Hoxie was sort of a grifter and that all of his marketing relied on the fact that the medical establishment was trying to stop him. So he was like, clearly, the AMA didn't damage your business by attacking you. This is how you're selling your treatment. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's, that's that is a such weird... a weird train of thought. <laughs> yeah. I I want to try to be fair here. And they're like, no, there's no fair. What are you talking about? Yeah, it's very weird. And the judge responsible for this baffling ruling was a guy named Atwell. And he was on the bench again in 1950 when the FDA went after Hoxie with the intent of hitting him with an injunction to stop him from treating cancer. Their argument rested on proving that the Hoxie treatment did not work. First, they tracked down all the patients who talked to Senator Thomas. They eventually selected 16 cases where they were able to gather enough information to evaluate, you know, medically. Mm -hmm. All 16 of these cases fell into three categories either people who had never had cancer people who had had cancer but who had gone to like chemotherapy and actually had it treated and just also (laughs) taken hoxie's treatment or people who had actually had cancer taken only hoxie's treatment and died horribly so yeah i'm gonna quote again from the medical messiahs One of the most poignant cases presented involved a high school boy of 16 who, after a football injury, developed an extremely malignant cancer in a leg bone. When the boy's physician recommended amputation, the parents could not face this prospect and took their son instead to Hoxie's clinic. The medical director, the father testified, had guaranteed a cure. For some four months, the lad took Hoxie's tonics. They did no good. Several months later, the boy was dead. Had the amputation been performed, the physician who had first treated the boy testified he would have had a fighting chance. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. But I don't blame the parents either. No, no, no. I mean, fuck. Like, it's 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 fucked. It's fucked. It, that's that situation yeah. is fucked. But and it's it's also like, I would as scientists, yeah. I'm sure, like when they evaluate all this information, they're like, yeah, look, it's rarely this clear. Okay. Yeah. Hey, look, we're scientists. It's always like a little murky, and then you have to wait years. But this shit's pretty yeah. clear. He's full of yeah. shit. Yeah. Yeah. 
So Hoxie did not take the stand in his own defense. Instead, he brought up even more of his happy patients to testify on his behalf. Eleven people testified that Hoxie had cured them of internal cancers. Of those claims, three were based solely on the patient's word. Four were rebutted by research from the FDA, and the last four had no diagnosis other than the word of Hoxie's medical director, Dr. Durkee. Now, the district attorney in this case pointed out that maybe, just maybe, Dr. Durkee wasn't a great guy to take as an expert on anything. He'd graduated from an osteopathic college in 1941 and only interned for a single year <laughs> in an unaccredited hospital in Nebraska. Yeah, where I he'd threw seen, up most of the time. Yeah, was I was gross. puking the whole time. God, he was gross as hell, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, during that unaccredited single year internship, he had seen at most five cancer patients. By the time he joined Hoxie's staff as his medical director in 1946, he had seen less than 20 cancer patients in his whole career. Hoxie immediately had him seeing 35 to 50 patients per day. Despite his utter lack of experience, Dr. Durkee claimed he, quote, did not need a biopsy to make a diagnosis of cancer. Nope, you don't. Mm mm. You just yeah. need a good old hound dog. It's got a mm-hmm. cancer nose on him. <laughs> one, one of them cancer dogs. And if he'll, he barks he'll figure twice, it out. you got it. You got to get out of here. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's amazing. <sighs> on the rare occasions he did submit a biopsy to a pathological lab, the workers in those labs reported that he did such a piss poor job that the biopsy could not be used. Mm-hmm. In a sane world, this would have been damning. But Judge Atwell liked the cut of Hoxie's jib, and he ruled that the FDA could not claim that Hoxie's cure was injurious or futile. His patient survival rate was about as good as a real doctor's. Now, the only reason it was about as good as a real doctor's is that real cancer doctors treated real cancer patients, and Hoxie was primarily treating random people who came in with random problems who he then lied and said had cancer. Mm-hmm. So you see why his 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 treatment rate was similar to a real cancer doctor's. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Half of my patients who mostly don't have cancer survive. Half of your patients who have cancer survive. We're the same thing. So give me my license back. <laughs> Let's now. Yeah, it's great. It rules, Billy. It absolutely rules. Mm. It does. Mm. It does. It's, it's it inspires awesome. people like Elizabeth Holmes. Um. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, it did. The FDA appealed and asked a circuit court to grant the injunction instead, arguing that Atwell had been swayed by incompetent testimony, which he absolutely had been. Mm -hmm. A three-judge court reviewed the evidence and agreed unanimously. In particular, they found that only a biopsy could accurately diagnose cancer. A random dude's opinion that something was probably cancer was not a real diagnosis. They chided Judge Atwell for being so blind and deaf as to fail to see, hear, and understand the important effect of such matters on general public knowledge and acceptance. Atwell was required to institute the injunction. But before it went into effect, Hoxie appealed to the Supreme Court. They refused to hear the case, so Hoxie went around them and had his attorney send a suggestion to Judge Atwell. They very nicely proposed that instead of banning him from shipping his internal medicines across state lines, the injunction should just ban shipment unless the drugs were labeled to show that there was, quote, a conflict of medical opinion concerning their curative claims. <laughs> It's uh, that's n- modern shit right there. Yeah, <sighs> he's a genius. It, it is, you're not wrong, but you're wrong. You know? Yeah, <laughs> this is that is basically how most modern quacks get away with selling nonsense labeled as medicine today. And it's ironic to me that it actually didn't work in the early 1950s. We were just slightly less stupid about these sorts of things. So after a bunch more legal slap fighting, the original injunction was finally granted in in 1953. It went into effect in 1954 after one more last ditch appeal by Hoxie. Man, he could no longer ship his medicine across state lines, but he was still allowed to practice in Dallas. And this was not exactly a small business. In 1956, his gross annual income was estimated at one point five million dollars. And he saw money. more than eight thousand patients that year. Now, That's... since. Yeah, it's too many. Eight thousand. It's so many. That's. <sighs> yeah, it's cool. It's pretty cool, Billy. <laughs> it is really. It's it, it's good. <sighs> it's good and it rules. It's God. Yeah. We're all doomed. We are doomed, Billy. We are doomed. I'm gonna have but, fun with it, though. <laughs> yeah. 
So since he could no longer ship out of state, he launched a massive advertising campaign to convince Americans to travel to lovely Dallas for their cancer treatment. He used passages from the trial testimony as advertisements, publishing them in popular magazines. He hired shady doctors from around the country, a mix of quacks and real doctors who needed money, Mm -hmm. and he got positive quotes from them, which he also published. Hoxie embarked on a nationwide lecture campaign, plying audiences with lines like this. There's only one way they'll ever close that Hoxie clinic, and that's to put a militia around around it ah! yes <laughs> yeah it's amazing it's amazing uh he was so made for the 21st century he would have done incredible on yeah, facebook he really oh would've. my god yeah he he would have been fucking donald trump's like um uh fucking what do you call the uh, attorney general yes like, or not attorney general um surgeon what's the general. medical one surgeon, surgeon general yes. that's the fucking that's what one. i was just yeah. thinking yeah his face would be on cigarette packs going like these Absolutely. are cool these are the good cigarettes <laughs> Because I get a cut. <laughs> exactly. exactly. They're called half yeah. sticks. Yeah. Hoxie also hired a ghostwriter to publish his autobiography with the wonderful title, You Don't Have to Die. That is a good title. <laughs> That's a good title because a lot of people are terrified of that. Yeah, it's a great title. Now, this the publication of this book in 1956 is when he started claiming that his grandfather had come up with the herbal mixture at the center of his treatment. This is also when he started denying that his father, who had died of cancer, had died of cancer. Instead, he began to claim that the AMA had written out a fake death certificate to hide the fact that his dad had really just died of an infection. Man, so cool. that is... Yeah. There's layers going it on rules. there. It- <laughs> The battle he was waging against mainstream real medicine was at the center of everything Harry Hoxie did. He claimed that his father's deathbed handover of the recipe for his magical salve had included the warning, they will persecute you, slander you, and try to drive you off the face of the earth. And, excluding the word slander, this would wind up being true. And in part two, we will talk about how Harry Hoxie was finally driven off the face of the earth, or at least... Off the face of the United States, because Billy, I'm going to give you one hint as to where tomorrow's episode's going. Mm. Is it south south of the border? Down Mexico way. It's their their calling. It's 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 where it has to end. It It, is. It's the only place it can go. (laughs) (laughs) Once I once I stood before I even knew where this ended. When I read fake cancer cure, I said. We're probably going to wind up in Rosarito at some point, uh-huh. aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> I was just trying to remember the name of the town. I was like, there's a town. Uh, there's a couple of them. You know, the whole Baja Peninsula is a great place to do that work. <laughs> it's, it's pretty. Oh it is. It's a great. I love it. I love it. But I, it's, it is ironic to me that we have referenced uh, for a show with the... Um, the 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 goal that our show has of talking about the worst people in all of history the single town most commonly referenced in the show is not berlin it's not nope. moscow it's not even washington dc it's fucking tijuana <laughs> yes <laughs> well, i could go oh, there so good <laughs> uh, but this is the end of the episode billy you got some pluggables to plug yes when is this coming out God only knows. Okay, uh, just go to, I'm touring a bunch, uh, bwdtour.com. I'll be in Portland. I'm going to guess start of March, probably, maybe. Okay, like perfect. Uh, yeah, I'll or be Or maybe in the end of February. Tulsa. Yeah. Uh, I'll be in Wichita, Tul- Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Nashville, uh, Seattle again in April. Um, just go to bwdtour.com. Um, go to bwdtour.com. Thanks, guys. And you can find me on the internet somewhere, presumably, but the secrets have been lost to time. That's the episode. <laughs> you can actually find him at I Write OK on that Twitter. You can find us at Bastards Pod on the Twitter and Instagram. We have a T Public store. Robert also co hosts Worst Year Ever with Katie Stoll and Cody Johnston. And uh, mm-hmm. if you got your tickets to see Billy and Robert, at uh, Dynasty Typewriter on March 8th. Yay. Yay! Yep. And, uh, you know, um, if you want to take to Twitter to, to give me shit for making Sophie do all the work at the end of the episode, that's fair, uh, but I'm not going to change my ways. Never. <laughs>